All right, guys, before we start today's episode, just a quick reminder that we are now on Patreon. For as little as £3 a month, you can sign up and get access to the live show, episode zero, and a bonus episode now once every two weeks at least, which we're hoping to increase in frequency as more and more of you sign up as a, and as we go on. Thank you so much to everybody who's signed up already. We're really blown away by the amount of people that have signed up to the Patreon so far, and it's really going to help us grow as a podcast in the coming months. Aside from the Patreon, we've got a couple of uh, announcements stand-up-wise. If you'd like to see any of us do stand-up, all three of us have shows on sale in March this year. For Stuart, that'll be at the Stand Comedy Club in Glasgow. For Steve, it will just be at the Leicester Comedy Festival, details of which are in the description below if you'd like to see him if you're anywhere around there. I will actually be doing a wee mini stand-up tour of the UK in March as well. If you'd like to see me, I will be in London, Manchester, Newcastle, Aberdeen and Edinburgh before rounding it off by playing the King's Theatre in Glasgow on the 24th of March. Details of which, again, are all in the description below and we'll hopefully see you there. But aside from that, guys, enjoy today's episode. Welcome to the Some Laugh Podcast. It could be like, oh, that was some laugh, or there was just some laugh. Well, some laughs. Laughs. well no <laughs> promising all laugh. No, <laughs> it's, there's going to be some. It's some laugh. So you moved to, to Glasgow, Josie, you've been here for two years now. Yeah. And uh, how, have you, how have you found it? Um, I really love it. It's it, like, I feel genuinely embarrassed that for 10 years I wanted to move up and now I live there and I'm still really just like, people are talking to me on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> and like even, so this is how pathetic it is for me and how it hasn't, I haven't got over it. Today, when we, we like drove through the South Side and it was gloomy and rainy and I was just looking out like, so beautiful in this one. <laughs> <laughs> so and like, yeah, I just love it. It's good. It it's... looked lovely last week with the frost and all that. It looked oh, very yeah. like magical. I and went now... down to Costco and it was such a beautiful experience. <laughs> 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 a lot. I think I've ever heard anyone say that before. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very romanticised mm. version of. So, so what made you want to move to Glasgow? Like, did, what was it you liked about that? Um, oh god, it was a bunch of stuff. It was like about. So I, I I have friends that I make films with. Or I say that it's so hilarious. I've now lived here two years and we've made one fucking two minute <laughs> sketch <laughs> since I've lived here. But um, that's because we keep having kids. Like I have a kid and then I come out of maternity and then he has a kid. <laughs> and then he comes out and I have a kid. And it's like, oh, f- it's not bother. But um, yeah, I've been, I've been making films with my friend for about sort of 11, 12 years. Mm-hmm. And we... Um, I just sort of used to come up and we always wanted to do make them in Glasgow so there was that there's the fact that like when I was growing up I just really loved like Glaswegian music and like art and all just the culture of it and then oh there's a few other things I went out with someone who was from Glasgow and he kind of hated me so it wasn't great <laughs> <laughs> but we would like go through to Glasgow a lot and I'd be like the company is terrible the buildings you know <laughs> but like um, we had yeah I really really loved the city then I've been wanting to move a long time and then uh, as well as that like my friends who set up this label my friend Johnny I used to come through to come through. That's not even how you say it. This is so embarrassing. No, that's fine. No. I used to come up and then come go on. through to five. You would say that. Yeah, that's through. Yeah. Yeah, through. You yeah. actually see whenever we like you talk to a London-based comic and they go, "Are you are you going up to Edinburgh?" And we're like, "No, we're going through. We're going through Edinburgh. We're, we're not going through. <laughs> yeah, across Just going down the road. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I used to do some five. Basically, I was really in love with it and a big nerd for it. And then especially thinking about like the politics of Glasgow and the fact that it's got this like incredible history of like people standing with one another trying to change things. And like now I'm here, I just fucking love it so much. <laughs> and I see the pizza crunch in the chip shop and I shed it. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like everything about it. And do you know what else I was thinking about is like all the slang words that people don't realise that they know they're using. And I'm like... I, lo- I love you. I love, I love hearing it. I love it. I love. I love everyone saying thank you to the bus driver. People don't do that in London. Do that? No, is that a thing? I thought that would be a, a British thing. No, no. that's just. But we say even it, sometimes Scottish you say it sarcastically. Like, yeah. Aye, cheers, mate. Cheers. <laughs> you see all those shite, like very British tweets, or whatever. It's like, oh, we always say thank you to the bus driver, but it turns nah, out it's just shit. Glasgow. No. Or is that Scottish or Glasgow? I don't know. I guess in Edinburgh. This is where, this is where we're referring. Maybe just regions. <laughs> are we referring to Stuart on this one? Anywhere is this a Glasgow thing yeah, or is this Scottish yeah, Because <laughs> I reckon if you're in Newcastle, they're saying thank you. To be fair, I bet it's like, if it's good to gig, people say thank you. 
In London, people wish they could say thank you, but it's been beaten out of them. <laughs> <laughs> and in Kent, people don't even... Yeah. They don't want to thank them. No. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Life's shit. Why should I thank you? <laughs> I always Bye. thought Kent would be posh. I don't think I've ever been to Kent, is it? It's right. Kent to me, I could answer this in the most tedious socialist way in the world, where I'd be like, <laughs> Kent is the true uh, like victory of Thatcherism, right? Right. Heart but that's very boring. Like, <laughs> basically, it's a really, really unequal place where like rich people sequester themselves away yeah. and the way there's like fuck all for if you've got nothing else yeah but also it's got some lovely seaside villages so <laughs> <laughs> you can balance it out it's an interesting place see you want a bit fat chill but she'll have the beach <laughs> <laughs> she'll get up at six in the morning three hours sleep get in the water <laughs> oh, she she the Mr. Whip, it? <laughs> <laughs> but that's great and um because obviously so you mentioned obviously the like glasgow's kind of history like, like in social history and stuff like that and obviously you mentioned making films and you yeah. actually made a film called super November which is based in Glasgow slash Clyde Bank basically yeah, yeah. which is where me and Steve are from oh my yeah. God. I love it so much that you guys are from Clyde Bank and also it's so funny because it's one of the few areas in Scotland that I like know really well I'm like, oh yeah yeah well yeah. of course yeah it was Up amazing because I never got to watch the full thing I was sitting here before I started watching it this morning do a wee bit of research yes. for the guests coming <laughs> the on the hard podcast hard one research too. Yeah. <laughs> but I woke up late because I'm hungover but I'm uh, sorry I'm so happy for you <laughs> but uh, like, I was really enjoying it and I had to rush out the house um, but yeah it was just amazing seeing bits of Clyde Bank like the shot you're like on the bench in solidarity behind and stuff like that and I was like oh, I've been to that train station and that, <laughs> that's the library and all that so. nice. well, that was like, cause the, like you used to like Clyde Bank libraries because like, you, your character in it is a librarian in Clyde yeah. Bank library and he's got they got like they give you running the place and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, they did. And it was always like shot at night, which is so fun because right. like oh, yeah. everyone has to be out so you're shooting at like ten p.m. in the <laughs> library. So <laughs> exciting, but it's great. It, and that was the only location that we actually like got full permission for. Right. And then everything else was just like cobbled together. Because you were saying, because obviously, because there's a scene in the shopping mall. Uh, in Clyde Bank and you were saying you used like, get chased out there basically yeah, yeah. <laughs> my friend was like uh, my friend Doug the director was like look what we're going to do is I'm just going to keep the camera low we're going to walk through and we're just going to get some good footage of you sort of angling about guerrilla filming and then we got in and straight away someone was like oh <laughs> like, oh, probably because of the dodgy business practices in the show, so. yeah they thought we were undercover from the <laughs> panorama or something I must be the only one here that's not been chased out of Clyde Bank shopping <laughs> <laughs> I took what? that off the bucket list <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a beautiful experience mm. we went through like we were filming in you know the old co-op where they've got that beautiful I scene sure, yeah. And yeah. so there's like all these bits of Clyde Bank that I'm just like super fond of and reminiscent yeah. of. Because <laughs> um, yeah, that's right. always been used in like... Tune the Fat, you still always still filming. Because the thing show. about that co-op and bought my Clyde Bank though is it's like, there's no other shop that looks like that. Yeah. So I don't yeah. know why they film in there because it's like, what shop is this? Yeah. You've not been to that. Such a bizarre like, There's so much space in that shop. Yeah, like, yeah there's too just, much space. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just sort of like, okay, there's four jumpers and now I'm going to walk 25 yeah. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's some suitcase. fridges and stuff yeah. like I because I worked in the co-op uh, Clybank co-op but not that one oh, so okay. but that was like the head office so we always went there for training and stuff like that the head office yeah Are you thinking one day I'll get there one day I'll get to this co-op yeah. <laughs> but Steve, Steve's dad used to have a, a business in the shop mall didn't he yeah he had a stall in one what of did the, he do he sold mantelpieces <laughs> wow <laughs> <laughs> Who knew, that's a harsh thing though because once you bought a mantelpiece you're not coming back for more yeah not it, a lot of repeat it, custom it shut down <laughs> pretty fast <laughs> <laughs> he had it for like a year or two but uh, yeah oh, he had a, did you just a, have like a mantelpiece in every room in your house <laughs> yeah we, we, we were the main customers for my dad's business um, but yeah it's like that it's like you'll buy one mantelpiece in your life probably and it's so you buy two mantelpieces and you're like <laughs> 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 it's it was good to be back because <laughs> I used to go in and help him or whatever on a Saturday and I've, we've already spoke about this on the podcast before but it was a guy who sold like dodgy football tops across from the <laughs> ac across from the stall that he had and I'd be like oh I want to get the Bordeaux top for my Christmas and stuff like that and it'd be like just a mad knock off he stole it from some van or whatever <laughs> I probably shouldn't dox uh, Raymond but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that out Jennings is he still going strong I think it might be 
I thing. think it might be, yeah. But that's the thing, you can buy a hundred of them in your life. Exactly, yeah. yeah, you're going to buy a football top every season. World Cup just finished as well. Yeah. That's not boosted mantle. It was piece, always so. like the last <laughs> season's football top though. So you couldn't <laughs> get like the, the up and coming ones, but... Yeah. So there's a couple of things. So you got in the Yoka Ferry and this. Uh... <laughs> the guy who drives it is so sound. Right. We were like, please, can we do this? And he was just fucking like doing donuts in the water. <laughs> do you know, my, my boyfriend, he did a um, music video there that's really good. It's so funny. It's called the Johnny and the Baptist Detective Agency. And um, they went to the same, same guy, probably, right. and um, same place. And my, my pal Austin, who's like a tour guide and very good at like, he's a very charming man. And the guy was just straight away, like, before he'd even finished, like, of course you can film. Of course you can film. <laughs> I, mean, I feel like maybe once every five years, that guy just has his day. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, know. I mean, it's like a unique thing, because I've never been, I've on been on it. Been on you it. know, I'd, I'd, I'd not been on it until a couple of years ago, and then uh, basically I was getting my car repaired at Yoka, and my mate lives in Renfrew, so I thought, I'll just get the ferry over while yeah. I'm waiting in my car. And I got it, and I, in my head, I'd always sort of, I knew it was just a tiny crossing. Yeah. It's like two minutes. I expected yeah. it to be like... <laughs> Something grander. Well, when it's called a ferry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just a wee boat, basically, but it's, it's really cool, and you're just kind of like, you're like, yeah. I didn't even it's know so Yoko was by the sea. No? No, it's... All I know about it's from Lemmy. It's getting Clyde. Yeah. Yeah. All I know. It's on the River Clyde. Oh, you've got any business mm. being in Yoko still. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's funny about it as well is that, like, if you're trying to film on it, it takes so long to set up or whatever. So you literally have four seconds. You know? like, right, don't fuck this up. Otherwise, you have to go all the way back. All the way back. I think the can make the journey long enough as if he was doing donuts. Is that <laughs> that? Yeah. To be fair, that must be why he did it. He was he was dead sound because he did like let us do that. Yeah, and Just also give, you can pay giving you options fee. in the editors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I probably wanted to like show off his driving so he gets a bigger route. You know? so, what's the scene here? Are we getting chased by the police? What's going on? <laughs> Nah, just go across. Uh, my, <laughs> my auntie lives right beside it, and they always go to like the wee pub just across oh, yeah. the road. The, the ferry in, which the ferry again in. Is, well, yeah. We filmed outside that, and then we pretended. The was it the was, was it the doublet? I seen that in the credits. The doublet, but there's a doublet in Clyde Bank, and then there's a doublet across. No, the it's stand. a doublet in town. Ah, in the West End. The, yeah. the doublet was where we pretended was on the Isle of Egg. There isn't even a pub on <laughs> Egg, but fine. Because <laughs> you wrote that. Film as well. Yeah, I did. And so, what made you kind of base it in Clyde Bank and stuff like that? Like, what was the? Well, it's, it was partly because like m- the director, um, Doug, and the other main actor, Darren, are from Clyde Bank, and we wanted to like talk about the history of it. And partly because like I'm such a nerd for the history of it, like I love it so much. Yeah. In like a pathetic way. <laughs> like I was, I was saying to Mark that like I was like sat outside the big Asda's in Tory Glen waiting for the bus, <laughs> <laughs> and my daughter was being really like my baby was being sort of really wriggly she didn't want to chill out and this old boy like sat down next to me and I was like this guy wants to chat and I don't want to chat mm-hmm. and then he starts chatting and he's so dull and I was like great <laughs> I'm going to have a long chat with this dull old boy he's like telling me how to live my life and then he sort of goes turns to me and he goes my grandfather was a red Clyde cider. You won't know what that is. And I was literally like, please tell me everything. Tell me everything. <laughs> and then we chatted the whole fucking bus journey all the way back. I was like, oh. and, but like, I love all that. So like, we wanted to kind of talk about that and, and get that as like the underpinning of it. But also it's because, you know, being from there, Doug knew loads of people could get us locations. Yeah. We could use his mum's house as a unit base. Right. <laughs> and she oh, was nice. super sound about it. Um, but as well as that, um, I don't know, like, yeah, like I say, it was like the first place in Glasgow that I really got to know and really got right. to love. And I do really love it. I think it's a brilliant place. Um, especially now, I still haven't taken my daughter to the good swimming pool that has flumes. Mm. It's like, my whole life is like working. Well, has that been knocked down? Because yeah. it was the playdrome oh. that used to be there. Playdrome, it's been that's knocked been, down. That's away, but they've got a new no, one. No, there's a new one that's got I don't like, know if it's got, flumes. got, I've not actually been in there. Oh, has it got flumes? Because there's the... Maybe it's just got a wave pool. Oh, yeah. Because the, the playdrome yeah. in Clydebank used to have a wave pool. And it had two and flumes. Two flumes. I've been in the playdrome as an adult. Have you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm you, over about 27 years old. Did you not say you, you and your pal used to try and visit many shite? We went through a phase. See, when me and Ben were just like out of uni, but we were just bumming around, nothing to do. We used to go and swim in away days. So we'd, do, <laughs> we'd do like Perth away because it's got an outside bit. It's a good pool. That sounds amazing. Just, I just, just love Just that. two guys enjoying each other's company going for a swim, <laughs> you know. Did you ever go to the waterfront in Greenock? 
That's no. got an outside. They, that, had, they no, but they had a shoot. The shoot went outside the swimming pool, so you see, yeah. like, came, it was like, outside and then go back. Where is it? Is it Guruk's that's got the actual outside? Yeah, yeah. I've always I'll tell you what, we went to the late night swim there in the summer, and it was all people. So I'm forty. It was all people older than me behaving like they were twelve fucking years old. <laughs> <laughs> we were playing like dance hits from the nineties, and we were like doing cannonballs in and like, like <laughs> chatting to boys and shit. Like that. Was, and everyone, no one was swimming. Everyone was in a little group treading water. It was amazing. <laughs> it was like, Okay, so that's what it was. The playdrome had the aqua disco, the aqua disco <laughs> back in the day. So Friday, Saturday, Friday night, I think. Yeah. You were like what underagers, like yeah, it's f- probably 14, like 12, 13, 14 whatever. sort of thing. I but it was just like a disco we and the swimming disco. baths. Did you? Yeah, Beacon Leisure Centre, Port yeah. Island. <laughs> shout, shout out. Was it called the aqua disco? It's called the the pool disco. That's not as Different good as cultures. the aqua disco. Yeah. Aqua <laughs> is more romantic. <laughs> French for water. <laughs> but so, do you feel like as a culture we've lost all these beautiful things? A wee bit. Yeah. Like, because I think, like, because I was saying to Josie in the club, it's like, like, when you grow up here, you just, like, you know about the shipyards and the fucking zone factory. I and literally you, meant leisure centres. <laughs> all right, you mean, all right. Yeah. No, we are losing that as well, no, to be fair. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, no, but you're so well, right. That as well, like, Have you ever know. been to Govan Baths? No. Uh, have I been? No. This is so. I love to swim. I love to chat about swimming. I'm so fucking boring for it, and I've barely <laughs> been to any swimming pools in Glasgow. Because I, I don't think it's. I think it's kind of abandoned now. But you think you is can? Is that a Govan Hill baths you're talking about? Oh, yeah. Govan Hill. They do they not have a whole thing about saving it. Yeah, yeah. I think Dang. so. But I'm sure my mum said that back in, when she was a wee girl. They didn't have like a bathroom or anything, so they had to go to like the local, the public baths wow. to have a bath once a week. And it was like Govan Baths I went to. Wow. There you go. It's just weird. Because you just think that means just, again, water. Like it's just a swimming pool. Uh, but but it's probably realize... people are actually having baths <laughs> yeah. in the swimming pool. Or maybe just the showers after, I don't know. I don't know. Because I feel like, yeah, that's definitely it. And you just think like, I don't know whether people are swimming. or I know that they used to be separate big baths yeah in some places so maybe you could like take a you bath you could have a bath after your swim but maybe it was like if you if you've got money you can use a bath on your own <laughs> and if you haven't you've got to go in this like toxic suit yeah, yeah. Just stand there. get the chlorine off you I don't know where I've seen this and I don't want to bring it down too much but apparently back in the day in some places they would all need to just go to the toilet next to each other and there was no separation oh, really? And people, that was just the norm. Is that back in like the 1700s or something? It may have been, I don't know, really know, but uh, apparently. So but like, just... uh, this is probably quite dull as well, but I, I was <laughs> interviewing people about from the Museum of the Home in, um, in East London, mm-hmm. and they were talking about how, like, how they put in fresh water to London and how late it was, and how initially it was just to a little part of London to rich people. And you're like, Hang on, yeah, so like all these people living in like, you know, thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people just had no access at all to water whatsoever. It's like if you wanted to go and wash, you had to like walk down to the fountain, get your little cup of water, take it. Like there just wasn't any. And it's sort of like, obviously on some level you know that, but you don't think about it. Like like nothing, like no, never even just the sip. Yeah, exactly. It's the the most basic necessity. Yeah. I feel like any time until about 50 years ago would have been unlivable for yeah. the yeah. comforts today, basically. Like, and yeah. yeah, if you look on the internet, everyone says it was brilliant. I know. Because yeah. 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 I always got the sense even my grandparents were basically dehydrated the whole time. <laughs> 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 Hydration's pretty new, isn't it? That's like the last 20 years. Especially with like alcoholism. Like <laughs> I think everyone's grandparents are alcoholics. <laughs> <laughs> Just had to drink to get through it. <laughs> Mine are anyway. Um, <laughs> Mine are dead. So, so, I I did uh, I did watch the whole film by the way Josie uh, and uh, <laughs> by the way it's, it's highly recommended I, I absolutely loved it Super November it's on Thank Amazon you. Prime I watched it it's like a genre, genre, so I never got to I hear it's a genre mashup is that right <laughs> yeah I was like I, I should talk about you only know it's one of the genres <laughs> I, I only got to the rom com <laughs> element you know like it. actual interviewers never admit to I haven't only seen half <laughs> no I love it <laughs> Mark Kermode like well I, I'm get I got the gist of it <laughs> Yeah. Do you know, I have to interview people who like written book. Me and my friend do a books podcast, and he's really, really into science, meeting scientists, reading science books. And I now know I have ADHD, so it's not my fault. I can't like so often. It's just too dry for me. Even when they're beautifully yeah. funny, written, whatever, I can't read them. So then I have to go into interviews where I'm like, I haven't read this book. <laughs> this book is about science. 
just gonna have to seem like I get what's going on. <laughs> I remember once we were interviewing someone who was talking about consciousness, and I like started talking about trees, and he was just really, really <laughs> gently like, "That's not consciousness." <laughs> if I'd read even one page of the fucking book, I would know that. I've not read anything. Read read chapter saying. one is consciousness. Trees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> see, see, when I was at uni, I done English at uni, right? And uh, like, so I basically a lot of my life was just mm-hmm. doing that. Like, I was reading the spark notes to the Wikipedia yeah, and going in and put, like bullshitting your way through the tutorial but there's this one time <laughs> uh, we, do, we got we were meant to be reading uh, Pale Fire by Nabokov and so oh, yeah. the day before the tutorial I was buying the book in the uni bookshop and my tutor was standing behind me in the <laughs> queue <laughs> <laughs> and it was all set that book's all set in an American university and so the next day we come in, we start talking about the themes and I'm like, yeah, I think the green symbolises this and all this sort of shit, right? And then he goes, right guys, because it's set in a university, we're going to have a, a pop quiz, uh, which is basically, a pop quiz is basically easy questions about a thing if you have read it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, what is the name of the university? They're saying, what is the name of the guy that's the main character? And I didn't know it. And then he's like, Mark, how do you, you know, <laughs> he's been talking the about these themes and that, but you've no, you don't know anything about the, the characters? And I was like... I you know, I've not actually read the book. Yeah, you know. Anyway, you was, get the yeah, gist of it. I, I can't help but feel like he'd done that on purpose just to fuck just me. Just because he saw yeah. you in the queue. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen you and you've been like, right, I'm yeah. taking him down. A hundred percent. I just read Lolita by Nabokov. And I, yeah, and I, I'd never, I tried to read it when I was younger and been like, I hate this book, it's gross. And then I read it and it's just like the most horrific horror story. It's fantastic, <laughs> but it's so awful and it's mm. deliberately so. And I think, uh, but then you read on the front, there's like all these contemporary reviews because it's written in, I think, in the 50s. And um, in fact, I know in the 50s. And it and it says like, oh, it is a book about love and a book about how to love. But when you, and it's like, it <laughs> fucking isn't. It's like <laughs> deliberately a horrific horror story about abuse. And I was just like, how the fuck did people at the time be like, yes, this beautiful <laughs> paedophile, but it's like <laughs> horrific. <laughs> anyway, but it's a really good book. And I, it was yeah. one of those things where I was like, oh, I just kind of not bothered reading No Book Off at all. And I still haven't read And the same with you. That's I mean, that, and I don't <laughs> want to read Lily. I started mind. reading that, and then I didn't ever want to take it out on public transport because it looked like a creep. <laughs> <laughs> you know it must be different as well because, like, I, like, I'm like, I'm straight, so I'm not even attracted to women, obviously. It's not a woman. It's, it's, but at the same time, like me as a woman reading that book is a different vibe mm. to a man reading that book. And yeah. it, yeah. I, I think you would still get the same sense of like horror. But yeah, you couldn't be like just reading my creepy book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you the last thing was like, well, if this guy thinks it's okay, then <laughs> you know, like, it's bad. Yeah, You'd need yeah, to put a really... post it on the front. It's like you know, <laughs> retweets do not mean <laughs> endorsements. Yeah, yeah. I think the main character is actually bad. <laughs> <laughs> Just like tutting and pointing at the book as I'm reading it. That's what I was doing when I I was reading it. I was literally reading it like this. (laughs) That was that tweet I seen and it was like, oh, I showed my boss that I'm on board by like reading the Communist Manifesto and shaking my head. (laughs) 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 So so back to the the film. Um, So there's a couple of things I want to ask you because in it, you drink Buckfast. (laughs) Did you really drink it and have you drank it? Outside of the recording, what do you think of Buckfast, Josie? It's, it's too much for me. That's like, what the one thing about Glasgow you won't embrace, isn't no, it? I'll give it a go. It's just fucking. So when I was about 10, 11 years ago, um, and my, my friend was like running festivals, and uh, I was sort of in with a crowd who were like such good drinkers, <laughs> such fucking good drinkers. And I'm just not. And I remember once we were like trying to drink these, this drink we made up called because um at the time I've been like nominated for the comedy award not trying to show off but when you do they give you a crate of fucking Bollinger champagne which oh, yeah. is so good yeah, that's and right. then if you get nominated years on the trot when they stop nominating you you're like where's my champagne <laughs> <laughs> I miss it um but we so we had them and we were like trying to make bolly bombs which was like buck fast in a thing of of oh, no. the champagne. Nice. Uh, with I think Red Bull as well Anyway, I, I, I had a panic attack for six hours. It was a full yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so uh, caffeine, caffeine yeah. and right. Buckfast. You don't need the me. extra uh, Red Bull. But. It was disgusting. It was, but we were all in this, like, we were on the island of Egg and we were in this, like, farm van. 
And then every time we do, we like bash on the sides, like Bali bomb. Bali. <laughs> it's like PTSD, man. It's awful. But um, yeah, I don't do. No, 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 I don't I'm believe you. I, I was we, never a buck first. I, I drank no. it when I was younger, but I did think I done. I probably done some irreparable damage to my. <laughs> was it something that when you were like thirteen years old, it'd be like this is what drinking is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. yeah. It's, like, it's, 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 it's like you know, it's part of the. It was. It part was of part culture. of the aesthetic, you yeah. know. It's like you had your tracky on and you and the bottle of wine and you went down the park and, and that's what you done. So and when I was a kid, it was white lightning. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, no, that, I was just going to say there's like a number on each bottle, but yeah. uh, people said like, was it the higher the number? The higher, the better? I think the lower the number, the better. It was like closer to the highest quality, but it was all made up. It had a lot of myth around it. It was, a lot yeah. of myth. It was and like, oh, I've got a number one. And today, that's when people go to the bottom of it, they say, oh, I'm doing it to the toenails because it's meant to be like they crush the grapes for the feet. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get the toenails. <laughs> that you were a white lightning person. Yeah, so I was talking to my friend about this the other day. Basically, like, where I'm from, when you're about 11, for me, it was like, I, was, I must be Where 12. are you from? I'm from Kent. I'm uh-huh. from Orpington. I'm actually that's from St. You know Mary Cray, it. but Orpington sounds nicer. <laughs> and I didn't realise that my whole life I've been saying, like, Orpington. And I should have been like, so Mary Cray. <laughs> but we they both sound nice to me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they sound nice. You don't need to. You don't need to check them. <laughs> but yeah, like where, where I'm from, it's like you're like 11, 12. And for me, it was like my older stepsister. And she sat me down. She was like, this is what drinking is. You buy a white lightning. It tastes fucking vile. You drink <laughs> two litres of it. And that's drinking. And yeah. You have to do it. And you can have white lightning or you can have like ice white. But it basically has to be that horrific cider that comes in there. Is that was that like the strong frosty eight jacks. percent or something mm-hmm. like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Frosty, frosty jacks. jacks. Yeah. Was it you? I was talking yeah. about this with you the other night. And yeah. You told me I was drinking this shit for years, and you told me it's not even made from apples. No, no that was onions. The CMB was. <laughs> onions, CMB told me God. that I was like, I've been drinking fucking onion juice all this time. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Down, that was the other one. Do you remember? Yeah, that? Mary what is Down. Mary Down? That's not made of onions as well. No, I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's cheap, strong cider, wasn't it? God, imagine if the whole fucking lot was onions all this time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it blew my mind when I found out that potatoes, like vodka, was yeah. potato juice. Oh my God, I've got my friend Connor. He's like such an inventive man, and he's been making his own apple jack. And he made his and he so so what you do is you like leave out cider in the freezing cold. Right. So this last oh, week when yeah. it was minus five, he left it out. But obviously it's so fucking cold; it's now like the most potent thing. Uh, did, what do you just scoop the the top? You take off? the ice off, and then you've got like just pure. Oh. Is that like scrumpy? Is that scrumpy? Jam? No, yeah. scrumpy's just. Is it just cider? Cider. Yeah. yeah. I know that because I'm English. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to Cornwall and I had some scrumpy. Did you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Where'd you go in Cornwall? Well, I probably didn't have because I probably got like the non-alcoholic version. Uh, I don't really remember. Just like whatever the I was in like, a caravan. It was like <laughs> shit, <laughs> the shit, the caravan all in some field. Yeah. Or something. Oh, I tell you what, I did do that made me feel really like um, really good about it. I, right. We went and stayed in um, Craig Tara. Uh, caravan park in Ayrshire and I was like I'm living the life <laughs> <laughs> they, had a, they got proper flumes and they got um, and I know Scottish people say shoots but I can't say it <laughs> they, got, they got this thing that's like a really scary slide going into different rapids and taking my four year old on it and her hating it and me being like you'll, you'll enjoy the next one because you can't leave when you're on the trajectory like. so you talk about like drinking when you're young and stuff like, but you started stand up really young as well didn't you Josie? I did, yeah. Yeah. 14 14, 14. yeah Wow. How did you... That's insane. How did you... Would you recommend that to other 14 years? No, because... Do you know what's really interesting about it? On one hand, I found this thing that I loved and I've always loved it. And it... I I know you will understand this feeling of like, I have such a pure way of expressing myself that works whenever I want, that I can do that night, that I can change, get instant feedback, loved it. But at the same time, like, it meant that I was always kind of out of step with other people my own age because I've been doing it for so long. And there was just like me and then no one else my age. And then Russell Howard was 19. And what happened to him? (laughs) But there was like about three of us who were anywhere near the same age. And at the time, this is like late 90s, it really felt like everyone else was 30 and talking about Star Wars. (laughs) <laughs> and I remember just being like, I don't care. This is an old film from a hundred years ago. <laughs> and um, then gradually, like, you meet more and more people. Like, as I got in my 20s, I'd meet people sort of more or less my own age. But, like, by the time I'd hit my 30s, I felt like I was in a completely different place to people who just started. Yeah. And so, like, I've always been in this place where I've felt, like, simultaneously, like, too long in the game and also really, like, 
too young. It, it's yeah. A, it's a weird yeah. vibe. I don't know whether I would, if I could live my life again, would I do it different? I don't know. But I also think I'm such an awkward person and I have such a like an odd relationship to kind of success. Like I love it, but I hate it at the same yeah. time. So I'm like, nice, no, I hate it. Yeah. And so <laughs> like, it's been a weird vibe. So I don't know. It's interesting. What's good is by the time you hit about 23, 24, you've done so much performing. People sort of see you as very confident. But even though I'm saying that, a lot of people fucking hated me when I was 23. <laughs> so like, I guess the other thing factor is, are you weird? Because if you're weird, people, I don't know. Yeah, I did start really young. I wanted so, to tell you about my film because you know how I'm, we wrote yeah. it. Me and, my, me and my friend Doug, we were like, right, I got three grand. I'm going to use it to make this film. We, we sat down in February. We were like, we're sick of trying to make films. We'd like put loads of time and energy into making the film, didn't get made. Uh, put loads of time and energy into pitching stuff and nothing was getting made. We're like, all we want is to make something as soon as we can to learn how to do it. And we want to make it as best we can. And we have three grand. So in the February, we're like, right, we'll shoot the first half in June. We'll shoot the second half in November or October, I can't remember. And then in between the two, we'll, we'll decide there was like a cataclysmic event, right? So it was going to be like a couple before and after a breakup. And then we were like, let's just put a fucking military coup in the middle. Let's just do that. <laughs> so we did that and like we, we wrote it around, but basically we had two shooting blocks and no money. So we kept, we managed to keep James Kirk, who's like the most incredible actor. He's yeah, so amazing. Yeah, he's yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. so good. Yeah. And like all my life since. Also, he doesn't care film. about acting. It's so annoying. No, it's yeah. so like the most naturally amazing person, but he just wants to be a fucking carer. I know. Like, You're wasting him. He's, <laughs> he's the most gifted. Oh, he's training to be a teacher. He's the most gifted performer in, in the yeah. world. But yeah. I spent the last six years since we did that film pitching shows. All the shows are like, James Kirk is the star. <laughs> and like basically not quite getting there to like get one over the line, but. But we, um, yes, we kept in, but we had loads of plans. So we had like um, uh, Sanjeev Kohli was in it and he was going to be like a big part in the second half. I know, because he's just he's in a bet, he's yeah. just playing football. Yeah, football. Yeah, he's only in it for like one minute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, there was a big plot about how he was getting his parents' van and he was rescuing us. And then there was a big standoff with police and all this <laughs> shit. And basically he got River City, so he couldn't do it. <laughs> and then there was a girl who's played my best friend. I think she maybe also got River City. I think River City just fucked us up. <laughs> <laughs> and so she couldn't do it. And so in the second half, I just had to like- With their four grand out. budget. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they had catering for three meals a day. <laughs> And then, so basically we had to like rewrite it. But the the main problem in the film is I didn't get to script edit hardly at all enough. So like, I wish I'd like spent years refining it, but we didn't do that. But we shot the first block and then I had to write the second block knowing the new limitations we had. Yeah. And even down to, again, we were going to have this scene where like we were in the McDonald's car park and we had all these confrontations. And the night before Doug was like driving us back because I was staying with him and his partner. And he was like, sir, there's no way we're going to be filming in mcdonald's tomorrow and i'm like what what the script's there what we did he's like so we, we just have to write a new scene tonight aren't we it's like midnight and so i was like uh, <laughs> oh, okay um <laughs> we, and so we that's how we ended up like this one army guy in this field so it's it was a really interesting exercise in like creative limitations and like mm -hmm. financial limitations yeah but also what's funny about it is we did the first block and me and sean biggerstaff who's the actor who played my boyfriend we're like became really close friends, had loads of fun, and we were shooting a night shoot. Mm -hmm. And I had to go down to London the next day because it was the Brexit vote. And I was like, I've got a fucking vote Brexit because I love Brexit. No, I'm just <laughs> 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 I've got to remember to vote against Brexit. So like, I, I, he was like, look, we'll just stay up all night, have a drink after the thing, stay up dr drinking and talking. You can sleep on the train home. The fucking, who can ever sleep on the fucking train <laughs> home? Like, hung over. So I was on this train, like haunted. <laughs> the woman next to me was like, then these cunts came down the train who were like, everyone vote Brexit, vote Brexit. And I was like, oh. And the woman next to me who'd been having lovely chats with me for two hours was like, great, I will, I can't. And I was like, oh, man, no. and I had this like really hungover emotional reaction to her. And I was like, <laughs> Don't forget my face because you are robbing my children. <laughs> <laughs> and you are robbing me. <laughs> and then we, we and then obviously we had like a bit of an altercation. Then there was just two and a half hours of the journey left when we started. <laughs> so then so the day before we finished that was the day that Brexit happened. 
And then the day before we finished the second part was the day that Donald Trump got elected. Oh, so we were like, we cannot make another film. Like, <laughs> look what we're Curse. fucking doing. Such well, a jinx. Because like, I was saying, yeah, like, because it's actually, a, it's quite prophetic because in, in the bit where the military coup happens and stuff like that, all of a sudden there's a curfew yeah. and there's all this stuff happening. And it's like, it really was like, it kind of really depicted lockdown in a way, like, even though it was obviously. By the way, spoilers, that. the film Steve seems purely a romance. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I was yeah. like, what is this? These guys get <laughs> I was invested in the romance. Oh, oh my god, I'm um, so glad. But I, I did know that it was like a genre mashup, so I was like, <laughs> I wanted to see the dystopian element of it, but I just never got around to it. But it was from the Clydebank Library. They were so generous, and they basically let us put up all these terrifying posters around Clydebank Library. And I... they were like, do not leave your zone. <laughs> like it's got, and that was really, it was so precious. It was a bit, and it was like literally like I, each zone, and it's like that was what it was like when it was like level three yeah, and level yeah. two and all yeah. that stuff. And I was like, yeah. fucking hell, this is. It's, it's unreal and what was so good about it as well is because it's like when it's like you and James scenes not so there's this coup don't leave your house after dark and all this stuff and then you're just like hey, you know coming out on Friday and all that. Still just, <laughs> which is kind of a little bit locked in it's like we're going for this fucking mad thing and then it's still just these wee interpersonal things that, that yeah. really life just kind of carries on yeah, yeah exactly. that's what I wanted to talk about in it is like this feeling that like you're always still going to be living your life no matter what else is going on you're always going to have like small concerns like yeah. I was trying to write about how basically you'd be like being arrested but you'd be thinking about the fact that you ate a plum and it was really flowery <laughs> <laughs> and you'd be like why that fucking plum and now I'm not going to have another plum <laughs> <laughs> it was so shit. And like, yeah. And um, Doug and me during the pandemic would just send each other screenshots and stuff like, yeah, what the fuck? It's super November. And we do that all the time. But it was it was kind of tragic for us because we were developing it into a TV show and I was so proud of it. And I was really, really certain that it was doing all right. And then basically we had it in with channels in March 2020. And then they were like, no, we're not going to make your fucking weird lockdown film show. <laughs> yeah. We're not going to make your sad show of people being stuck in their houses. I'm going to definitely watch the rest of it when I get in. When I get in. Is there any part of you that's worried that you were so tired and hungover you voted Brexit by accident? <laughs> Did you have that though when you were voting? It was so scary because yeah, you're I, like I was like, checking. I just want to make sure that I'm doing it right. It's like an exam, you're like rereading it 20 times to make sure there's no double negative. In yeah, the that's question. what I <laughs> Because it really scared me. And, and I remember, because I was in Lambeth at the time and Lambeth was like 80% people voted in. Right. And so it felt really like a nice atmosphere, us all going and stuff. And, yeah. <laughs> I did have um, I live in Nicola Sturgeon's constituency now and That's that was right. quite exciting for me because yeah. I was like the big boss <laughs> <laughs> the big boss is on the floor <laughs> Ben's are getting taken out on time every week don't worry everything's running smoothly I assume I don't know <laughs> I know there was bin strikes in Edinburgh and I'm not trying to trivialise how grim that can be but obviously I support the strikers but do you ever think now when people are moaning about the 70s and they're like there's rubbish in the streets I'm like just fucking chill out yeah, yeah. why are we all say we had rubbish in the streets here we all are you know? yeah yeah. Right. yeah it's fine obviously yeah. we've got a lot of strikes now going on at the moment Josie what, what have you been making now all this stuff for the nurses and the train wouldn't it be so ridiculous if I was like what? I'm anti <laughs> <laughs> get on with your job <laughs> <Come on. laughs> I think it's it's two things I'm really really glad that people are fighting and um, I support everyone who does it I support people who do it in the public sector in the private sector I support anyone I support it when they do it for their own pay when they do it for conditions when they do it for everything of course right but but they're lazy <laughs> <should be. laughs> there wasn't, there wasn't, it wasn't a but to do that I can't remember but also the reason it's all happening now this is what I was going to say is it's all happening now because people have everyone has been pushed to their limit and I saw fucking Jeremy Kyle who like why is this cunt suddenly proud again? <laughs> yeah. There's a documentary about how he drove people to their deaths and mm. now he's like, I'm back on the radio with yeah. no shame. I'm like, yeah. fuck. <laughs> like, but yeah, he was there and he was like grilling, was it Mick Lynch? He was grilling someone, Dave Ward maybe. And he was like, well, everyone's going to be suspicious. Why is everyone on strike? I was like, you are so close to understanding that everything is fucked. I know. <laughs> you, yeah. But I, I think that's the thing, because it's like, that's what's great to see, because like, every time the news are out, and they're always choking to, to a gun on them, but every time they're out in the news, they go, well, actually, pu public opinion seems to be with the strikers for large part. Mm -hmm. And it's because everybody recognises that, that everybody's feeling that yeah. thing, and we all know that, you know, inflation going up, Nadie's wages going up, and you're like, well, the fucking strikers, I, the, the train drivers ever race because we fucking all do. Yeah, and yeah. then I think people understand that now, whereas before it was kind of like that, I'm all right, Jack, sort of thing, maybe. And it's new, it's good that it's finally come back round to, I mean, like, to people 
been on side with it largely, but unfortunately yeah. that's be- maybe because everybody recognises how yeah, fucked yeah. we it's all are. It's yeah. 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 yeah, it's such a weird thing though because it's like obviously I, I support strikers and all that, but I've always hated Scott Real. So I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of I'm torn. I'm like, oh. I did have a stupid one line <laughs> joke. I wrote the other week and I says I've always been pro. Uh, striking rail workers and I actually I'm the reason why they had to put up those signs saying don't hit the staff when they take your tickets <laughs> I, you should move to Scotland now having been English and you'll find Scott Rail very charming really? <laughs> yeah because it's like we all win when we use the bin <laughs> I'm like yes we all do it's so uh, here's the other thing like when they say we'll soon arrive like it doesn't it's it's nicer than like the next <laughs> station like everything you need to just get some like proper rose tinted glasses and then yeah. you'll be like oh there's only one train every two hours How yeah beautiful. that's so uh, that's nice isn't it? <laughs> it's no, I, did, I tell you what other thing is really big for me and i think they're phasing it out which is actually going to break my heart being able to buy a ticket on the train feels so respectful being able to buy a ticket when you get off and not just getting a fine feels like they're saying we don't automatically assume that yeah. you're a criminal. Yeah. Whereas I feel like, particularly in like London and Kent, it's like, you, you are a criminal and we will catch you. Yeah. No matter what you do, if you have a ticket, if the ticket is slightly wrong, yeah. you are a criminal. We assume yeah. you're a criminal yeah. ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> it's up to you to prove you're not. Yeah, yeah. that's how it feels. It's crazy, isn't it? And that, that feels more respectful. Yeah, I was in London and it was like, I, it was, I was new to that system and it was like I got off a the underground and then onto a train and I thought I could just get you know I didn't know I had to change get a new ticket in between Aye. and stuff like that and then at the airport they were like no you've we're gonna fine you like oh, 60 quid or whatever whoa! yeah and I was like I didn't know I, I genuinely that I could buy a ticket now he's like nah unlucky shouldn't get on the train without a ticket I didn't know I had to get a fresh also, you can do that in Scotland they should understand that if somebody's used to doing that it yeah. might not be like yeah yeah but so I guess it's like the whole thing where if you go to a different country, you should know their road rules or whatever. So it's like you should just know that it's the other side of the road. Nah, they should just be like, <laughs> you know, fair dues, mate. You've you've ruined that shed. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. You buy them a new shed, we'll, we'll forget about it. Right. And you can plant a new tree. It's fine. <laughs> I was speaking to someone recently who'd just been in Germany <clears throat> and he was saying that like, over there, I don't know if it's true of everywhere in Germany, but I mean, and I've been, but like you can just buy a ticket on the train or beforehand, but there's no barriers or anything, there's no one there to stop you. Yeah. But you're respected as an adult, like we know that you're not going to try and dupe us, or the percentage of people will be so small that are trying to rip it off and like right. will save money by not having barriers and not having people there. And it, it does just feel nice to be treated as an adult sometimes. I feel like that would never happen in Britain. Yeah. Of like, mm. There's such a small mindedness sometimes, I think, where mm. people are so against like benefit scroungers and everyone's trying to, everyone's on the rob and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. But this is what kills me is like, I cannot believe that people are still pitching that kind of shit when it's so obvious. Like, it, you saw like Avanti getting like 6.5, what, million, billion? I, I, I don't want to sound stupid, but they got 6.5 something. <laughs> it was a lot. It's like, what's the difference pounds. between a million and a billion to you and I? Once there's a point <laughs> involved, it's loads, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. right? They've got lots of zeros on the end of what they do. And like the idea that they're still able to be like, you know, look at this person who's struggling and yeah. not like nice. all of the money that everyone pays in tax, even people, you know, who are homeless pay VAT. Like everyone is paying taxes in yeah. and we're just giving it to those cunts at Avanti. <laughs> For for because they're on the rope, like it's yeah. yeah. I know because like see when everybody moans sorry about, I know this is really obvious no no no, no, no. it's not but it's like see when everybody's moaning about all oh, these benefits scroungers and these people cheating the system and all that and you go you kind of go like, look the, obviously there's maybe an element of that to an extent but see if you I'm see, it. see if you <laughs> yeah. absolutely serious. because see if you see like a graph of like how much is actually like getting taken it's from the system oh, is that yeah. I mean and all these fucking corporations don't pay their tax and all this fucking shit and that gets given theft. out. Like wage theft, like big corporations don't pay people properly. They deny people over time. They like deliberately don't pay people things they've owed them and they know they'll get away with it. Yeah. If you look at the difference, it's massive. But also like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm a lot more like, if people... <laughs> No, if ordinary people are on the rob, that's good because Robin Hood is good. If very wealthy people are on the rob, that is bad, bad because bosses are bad. I've had problems with my daughter actually because my daughter's four and I try not to be too indiscreet and I try to explain my worldview to her, but it's very hard because, like, e.g., 
I would tell her often that I hate the Queen, right? <laughs> but her view of the Queen is the Queen is a lovely old lady because yeah. she like watches Peppa Pig or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and so then it's really hard because I'll be like, Mummy hates the Queen. And so she'll be like, I like the Queen. <laughs> and then I feel like, oh, uh. And so I started telling her things which are true that like she stole all her money from everyone and she's, <laughs> she's got big palaces that she doesn't share and that she's stolen lots of the land from everyone obviously she's dead now which I relish telling her <laughs> <laughs> but, like, I guess what she's fucking dead she's never coming back um, <laughs> took her to see the corpse no, the corpse. <laughs> we'll, we'll dig up the corpse but, so I t- so like I, I try to explain that to her but it's really hard because like like, A, you don't want your views to upset them and you don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. But, like, we went to see Peppa Pig, the theatre show, which, surprise, I fucking hated. And <laughs> halfway through, for no reason, the Queen shows up and everyone has to bow to the Queen. And Peppa? It, um, in real life? In, in the she film. A pig in the film? <laughs> <laughs> she just showed up. She just showed up. Hobbled on stage. <laughs> we had to. So what is it? Is it like an actor playing the Queen? Or, or okay, what so is it? I actually think, if I remember a right, I'm going to take my jump off. This is going to ruin the continuity. <laughs> no, that's no, okay. no, you're not. I'm <laughs> so, oh, sorry, we're in the show, right? It's all Peppa Pig puppets being voiced by adults standing behind them and the adults do like a weird kiddie voice yeah. that is horrid oh <laughs> mummy no, don't worry like, awful although I should say I do a voice for my baby that's a bit like that because it's really boring not boring lovely but hard being around just you and a baby so I do do a voice for her but yeah, of course. when I do it it's different it's like Robin Hood so they... <laughs> go try and work up bet somewhere yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. so it's like all these pigs and then there's a bit where they're like bow to the queen bow to the queen everyone had to stand and bow to the queen and I literally went I'm not bowing to her <laughs> <laughs> but my daughter got very upset because obviously everyone else was bowing to the queen and I was grumpy for reasons she didn't understand and I had to yeah. like check myself and be like I can't do this in front of her but it was really hard because at the same time I'm not fucking bowing to the queen yeah. so it's very weird <laughs> and like similarly with her with bosses I always say to her like the bosses are bad and that the big bosses take all the money and like I know it's going to sound facile but I'm just trying to like vaguely introduce her to this idea that like wealth in our country is incredibly unequal and skewed yeah. and that is true you know yeah um but the problem is then she said to me i'm never getting a job because i never want a naughty boss <laughs> like, uh, um, some jobs would be okay you could be a doctor uh, i don't think you need to worry about it just because a teenage rebellion by the sounds of it is going to be coming a massive tory i was gonna say yeah, <laughs> what happens but, if you raise britain's only right wing comedian <laughs> <laughs> if only there was only one right wing <laughs> if only <laughs> but then she said to me, because then I felt really bad and I sort of was trying to backpedal. And then we both were like, look, not all bosses are bad. Boss Baby is all right. <laughs> so like, yeah, Boss Baby's pretty yeah. sad. Boss Baby seems I've not cool. seen Boss Baby. What's the politics of Boss Baby? Bad. Real yeah, bad. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine. Boss Baby would report you to the authorities. <laughs> <laughs> there must be so much of that stuff. Like the, the, like, cause I would never. I, I would assume that Peppa Pig would have stuff. I mean, that's a bit on the nose, the whole Bout of the Queen thing, to be perfectly honest. Like, but the, is there a lot of stuff like that in cartoons and the stuff that kids watch? Or this Copaganda and all these type yeah, of things? Paw Patrol. <laughs> yeah, Paw Patrol. Paw Patrol, Paw Patrol I guess uh, so. Yeah. yeah, one of them is like a cop. <laughs> this yeah. is it. Like dogs, on the whole, dogs work for good. But some dogs are scabs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some dogs want to stop everyone taking drugs. You know, some dogs want to help people who like help blind people, help people who have emotional needs. And some dogs want to ruin everyone's fun. <laughs> <laughs> this is how life is. Using those snuffles for. No, there is a whole bunch of stuff like that. And you find yourself watching stuff. This is the problem too, is like, there's nowhere like super safe anymore. Insofar as like when I was little, and I suppose it wasn't that safe because like ITV had like adverts for like shit and stuff, but you could only watch BBC Two or whatever, BBC One, whatever was on. And there were three programmes and they'd all been really thought about. And now, even with CBeebies, they fucking put Coco Melon on there. And Coco Melon. I've never seen like, Coco Melon. What's funny is I'm 40 and you guys are like, what, 21? Oh, <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> you guys are a bit younger and like, 
I'm just so glad that you don't know what Coco Melon is. It's I've like heard the name. I've, heard of it. I've heard the name. What is it? It's like I'm still not sure what White Lotus is. Oh, <laughs> oh White, White Lotus, Lotus is, is fucking great. <laughs> and my daughter loves it. You know, White White Lotus. Lotus. it's the guy who wrote uh, School of Rock. Is it? Did he write School of Rock? Jack Black. <laughs> no, not Jack. <laughs> <laughs> What's Mike, funny Mike, is the guy's called Mike, Mike White. White. The opposite, yeah. of, Jack <laughs> the opposite <laughs> of Jack Black. <laughs> His evil twin. <laughs> but yeah, um, he was Mr. Schneebluck. Yeah. Wow. So do you know he wrote a film that I saw as a teenager called Chuck and Buck and that's why I knew do you ever have that where you know like a really stupid reference for someone but that's your reference there yeah. huh? it's like with the guy from The Walking Dead and I'm like that guy's egg from this yeah. life and I refuse to update it so I'm like oh egg from this life he's yeah. not Bette Midler for Hocus Pocus <laughs> true pretty much yeah. Coco Melon what is that oh my god Coco Melon is like this computer generated thing of and all of it is so like it's a little family that lives in like a really car culture place so they've all got their car and they go to the shops and that's all they fucking do and they sing songs that are like yes yes i want to brush my hair oh no yes, that's not that yes, is it yes i want to brush my hair oh i fucking like, hate oh, my- it'll be like dad dad would you like a cookie? <laughs> no, thank you, son. And it's like the fucking worst. <laughs> man, my niece like, watches oh, that on yeah. YouTube and I'm like, this is infuriating. It's the oh. brushing the teeth one. It's like, br- yes. got to brush your teeth, that Fuck thing. Yeah. It's, oh my God. But YouTube is the wild west for shit like that. So my daughter is too canny now. My partner used to, if she gets up at like six, she can watch cartoons for a bit. Mm-hmm. So that like one of us can like have a snooze, especially with the baby, it's really hard. She can watch a bit of cartoons. So she give him his phone. She used to just watch CBeebies. Just watch Bluey, which you guys won't know about, but it's the most fucking incredible show yeah. about some incredible dogs who do imaginative play. It's fucking brilliant. <laughs> if it was just Bluey out there, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> but my daughter's now so clever that she'll be like, yes, yes, I'm watching CBeebies, Daddy. And then my partner's like, okay, fine. <laughs> and then she's like, goes on YouTube and watches this fucking show where people play with dogs yeah, of my Frozen. Yeah, that, yeah. But, it's, but they're, like, the woman, who, the girl who does it is... A prick and so she's like <laughs> i'm gonna be the most beautiful one when i get my nails done <laughs> no i am i hate you i hate you too and i'm like yeah. this is not good yeah it's just yeah. poor storytelling at best <laughs> this is it. she's not gonna understand about denouement or anything <laughs> two clicks and she's on jordan peterson <laughs> so that's the problem it fucking feels that way is, i do worry i was worried about that yesterday i was like oh god how do I protect it from the world? <laughs> it just seems that it's so unstoppable, all that stuff now. But I guess probably, like, you know, for all our parents probably felt the same about the yeah. telly stuff and all that to an extent. I don't know, but I remember they just patched it down and thought, ah, fuck it, who cares? <laughs> yeah. It probably was the tell I just, just like, Something scary about the algorithm now, though, I think. Because obviously we had YouTube right. when I was, like, 15, you'd type in dumb shit or whatever. But it, it was always just, like, you'd watch whatever you were watching. Yeah. It was never, like, two wrong clicks and you're fucking alt-right. Yeah. Which yeah. seems to be yeah. what it is now. Yeah. yeah. Or even now, if you're not logged in and you look at what it recommends, it's like the Sun newspaper, fucking Sam Harris, this, yeah. and you're like, yeah. can I just recommend me like <laughs> Butterfly Sanctuary? <laughs> <laughs> like, man learns how to use pottery wheel. <laughs> it's always like so intense and like, horrible. Uh-huh. I think it's because it's legitimate now and it's like people can make a living from it and stuff. Like back then, it was just. Daft. All amateurs, yeah, yeah, amateur yeah homemade videos things. and stuff yeah. on it. Like, and you know, know, it's like that. this is a legitimate thing that you know people. Will, this is the people's living, and yeah. and men, you go, oh, this must be le- legit. So yeah, but isn't that so ridiculous as well? The idea that you'd be like, I'll put on my shirt and I'll go and do my YouTube. I mean, I, I appreciate <laughs> we're doing a podcast, but we're comedians, and that is a noble. Oh, of course, it's, it's art. It's, it's art. High art for the YouTubers. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, because mm-hmm. it's mad on that because like that's what every kid I've heard wants to be is like, just be a YouTuber. Is it still YouTube or is it not TikTok? I'm probably. I mean, I don't mm-hmm. know. Like, I think because YouTube's still big for kids, isn't it? But maybe, maybe both. I don't know. But it's just I, th- to me that's because then it's like because at least if you want to be a comedian, it's like that's a thing. It's a craft. Like, yeah, it's a craft. But it's a just, noble craft. just <laughs> you know, you, that, that'd just be like going. I want to be a TV presenter. When you're like doing TikToks, do you know what I mean? But like, the people, it does nothing to do with the content or what you want to say. Then it's just I want to be in front of a camera and have loads of people watch me. Mm. Which, yeah. to be fair, is the motivation well, for what I can do. But <laughs> well, a lot of people back in when you were we would be like, I just want to be famous. That would be a thing. Like, yeah. going Big Brother or whatever. It's like I just want fame. That's so I guess it's now at same least, impulse in it, I suppose. Yeah, but. but at least you're maybe making your own videos and stuff. Or I don't know. I don't know. But it's so weird <laughs> things like that. Like, so I've had it where. 
when I was younger, I was on TV more. People knew who I was more. Now most people don't. I much prefer now that most people don't. Like, it's lovely. I can, like, eat a... I was a, like, <laughs> eating nectarine on the bus, really sloppy. You know, like, <laughs> shit, you know, like, so getting papped. Pick things out of my hair or whatever, you know? As the world collapses around you, you're just focusing yeah. on this nectarine. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know, my friend wrote a poem, actually. This is after the after the film. He wrote a poem called The Day the day we destroyed the world i ate a peach <laughs> about climate change and about the same thing of like he was just sort of talking about his daily life and then talking about like the hottest day ever in glasgow the hottest day ever in motherwell you know and like how all around him the world's collapsing and how like he's thinking about trying to have a child and he's like buying a fucking bamboo toothbrush that doesn't work and stuff <laughs> it's my friend henry bell there we go shout, shout out, out. Shout that's, out about. that's yeah. interesting you mentioned about the, the telly stuff Josie because obviously if you, st- you started at 14 so when did you when did you like first do like telly stuff and all that then was it do you know oh well my first experience of being on TV was when I did the BBC New Comedy Awards I was 17 I fucking won it thank you yeah, yeah. two winners yeah. yeah. on the oh, 2018 yeah. the set. did yeah. you win one did of the, the, when did you did you win 1998 or 19 2018 how did you find it where was your final uh, at the fringe in one of the big BBC tents <sighs> Um, Tent, that's harsh. Yeah, yeah. And was it, was it like fun. the gig of your life as well? It was really yeah. fun. I enjoyed it. The semi final was more fun than the final. Sure. Because I was nervous and it was like, this is going live on radio after the, the Archers or whatever the fucking program <laughs> yeah. was. And I was I like, know, ah. That's the only time I've listened to the Archers and I was tuning in to hear <laughs> the, between the results. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it was weird. What was it like when you done it? So when I done it, they were, it had only been going about three or four years and they were deciding to like put it on BBC One. And I had a similar thing with the semi-final was like the gig in my life. And it was filmed, but it was filmed for like, there used to be like obscure cable channels called like UK Play, I think it was called, that became oh, yeah. something else. And like TV no Gold one, or something? Yeah, though. yeah. but prior to that, with, right. I can't remember what it's called, but like 10, so nobody would watch that. So that was kind of on TV, but like you'd have to have a very specific yeah. thing to do it. So we did, um, did that, loved it. The final two things, like firstly, it really disabused me of like my real childhood innocence where we all did sets. Obviously, like it was the gig of my life. I won it. Like it was, it went wonderfully. But then they had to edit this seven minute set to two minutes. And around it, they had loads of clips from like famous comedians giving advice to new comedians. Mm. And then they would show our sets. And so I invited all my friends to like come around and watch it together and my boyfriend at the time's house and we were like so excited about it and I was really proud of it and I was really like I can't believe we're all going to be here I won so I know it's going to look good and then they edited it and I looked fucking dire it was like two really? minutes and it just they edited out half the punchline yeah, it just looked yeah, really yeah. incoherent and I remember just being so like oh my god they edit tv yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god it's not going to be how it was and yeah. I felt so stupid for like not knowing that but the other thing that was fun was that when I did it Bob Monkhouse, who was like the Jimmy Carr of his day, yeah, yeah, yeah. big guy. He was there and he was hosting it. And he I hosted the set. final. Mm-hmm. Really? What yeah. year was Baguette. it? It was 1975. <laughs> <laughs> he was old then. He was an old man. It was near he the was, peak of his power. No, was it was a retro decision. He was an old man and I was 17. That says, he was an old man. Bloody Lolita again. Oh, <laughs> he showed me the book and he said, you should read this. It's a love story. Is that the, the first time you tried it? Yeah. So, it, this, right, he's presenting it. I was on about second. And I did enjoy it, but I never thought I'd win. Just because, like, there was me. David Doherty was in it. He was He's seven years my senior. We've been friends for, like, however long it's been since then, 23 years or whatever. But he um, he was the youngest person next to me, and he was 24, 23. Right. And then all the rest of them were, like, men in their late 30s. And half of them were doing, like, real clubby stuff that yeah. they'd been doing since fucking, I don't even want to say, 1978. What was your and my mother-in-law jokes like back then? <laughs> I did have a joke that, that I wouldn't do now, but I used to just, for no reason, be like, my wife, she's so fat. She's in danger of having a heart attack. I love her. I don't want her to die. Which I would never do now because I think it's really fat phobic. But as a kid, little kid, I really thought, like, how yeah. funny that I, a 17-year-old girl, <laughs> and like, oh, my, my first ever opener was, hello, my name is Frank LaBeouf and I play for Chelsea. <laughs> and then I just stand very still and no cunt would laugh <laughs> and I thought this is the funniest thing in the world <laughs> my stuff was very stupid then I like, couldn't talk about my life because like my life was quite 
bleak really like my family situation wasn't good so I couldn't be like coming on stage and being like you know when your stepdad's you know so I have to be like you know when you buy a pie and the pie is full of dreams <laughs> it actually wasn't that bad it was actually, I, I, that was not a bit that was me trying to improvise a bit as I would do I was hoping they edited it for the viewers <laughs> <laughs> that's what it fucking looked like so, so I'd done the set it went well I thought I'm not going to do it I was the only girl I was the only child and they, they said to me what do you want to drink backstage and I said Bacardi Breezers now <laughs> <laughs> that was illegal of them but they got me a case of Bacardi Breezers they don't get your weight late then no, no so I was shouldn't. like that's what drinking is <laughs> but they gave me this case of Bacardi Breezers and so I just fucking from Orpington knew how to drink <laughs> caned into them right but I hadn't been able to when I was really little and started doing stand up I couldn't eat for like two days beforehand I was so nervous you know so I have these Bacardi Breezers I haven't eaten for two days I have about four I'm utterly wrecked and um, in the <laughs> before interval before you go on or is this after? no after, after after in the interval while they're doing the judging the band and this will age it from 1999 <laughs> the brand new heavies from before Winked, <laughs> classic 90s beautiful <laughs> and then Bob Monkhouse comes back and he sees that I'm a bit drunk and he's like what are you doing? <laughs> don't you know anything about showbiz <laughs> she's like what are you doing you, you, you're going to win I was like I don't think I'm going to win he was like well you might win you've got to sober up <laughs> so he's like in my dressing room they've given me a fruit basket you need to go in there and eat all of the fruit <laughs> it's like when it never, and I'm just eating Bob Monkhouse's fruit eating basket nectar like, yeah yeah <laughs> this, this, is flowery back, this is obviously was back before old men would think twice about inviting a young drunk girl <laughs> No one ever talks about the positive experience. <laughs> 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 talk a wee bit about politics and stuff like that me and Josie we were both on breaking the news on the same day that Boris Johnson resigned mm. quite a difficult day to try and pre-prepare some topical jokes when the, <laughs> the news has changed so much that was mental though wasn't it it was and, but all of us were just sat there even the producers we were just sat watching the door like holy fuck <laughs> <laughs> and then did he resign just before because I was because I was late coming in and I was listening to him resign as I was walking to the to the show and yeah. it's just like absolutely nuts like just and yeah. then as I was saying like the, the the last time I'd done it so the next time after that mm. was the we got told about 10 minutes into the show Liz Truss had resigned oh so in those <laughs> 10 two, minutes in 10 minutes yeah. in so like <laughs> we're done like oh I wonder what will happen now you know ah, she'll stay and bring Boris back and all that and all of a sudden it became real <laughs> and we're like shit <laughs> <laughs> get on there's like too much news to do topical news stuff it's because it's like you can't even have fun with it anymore because it just comes true yeah. and it's bad the tectonic plates are just constantly shifting yeah. so it's hard to really get like you know to go right I'm going to I've got this bit that I can then use for the next five months on tour or whatever yeah, it's yeah. so hard because it's just constantly changing but and but, everyone like on Twitter or whatever has a, a voice now so there's you, you all the jokes have been done immediately every joke yeah. has been done it's hard yeah. Yeah. me and Steve yeah. were making a topical like radio sketch show and uh, the second week we were making it the Queen died as we were like recording it and then editing it so we knew it wasn't going to go out <laughs> They had, so a very a different, they had a very different they had a very different fucking response yeah. to the wasn't much in, the in that room either to be <laughs> and, uh, but now it's come back in January but all the like characters we'd set up and everything like Liz Truss and blah 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 it's like it's all different now yeah. so we're going to have to start again yeah exactly oh yeah. my god yeah I didn't even think of that like imagine like you're an impressionist and it takes fucking two months to learn a really good impression yeah. and then everyone's like that person's career's over <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't even have the time to like build up yeah 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 as soon as you start getting booked as a Liz Trust act, you're <laughs> fucked on that. I heard, so who was it? Somebody did something like that. Where they, in earnest, were saying, isn't it really sad for Boris impersonators? And they were trying to get people to feel really sorry for them. Is there anything that's not sad for Boris impersonators? Because bloody hell, what a life. That's bleak, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Michael Fabricant still seems to be doing right. <laughs> <laughs> that's where it's like, how the fuck is this still allowed to go on? Right. Like the Michael Fabricant, it should be that someone just comes in and goes like, we've all had a lot of fun, but you're out because you're obviously deranged. <laughs> yeah. You're out. Like and just, I suppose what I'm saying is someone should like clear everything out and that's, <laughs> that's dodgy ground. But I just mean We need like, to have a military coup as we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but good coup. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing because oh, it's like, you know, they're always going about the January 6th riots and all that in yeah. America and I'm always like, well, I'm not not 
for them storming the capital just for different reasons. reasons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Could be the first podcast where we incite a riot. <laughs> I, I just like it now that uh, I have children and I don't want to go to prison. <laughs> yeah. That's Yeah, that's the thing. I was trying to write stuff about the laws that they've brought in and largely Scotland is sort of separate because luckily of having like independent judiciary and stuff. But like, if you look at the anti-protest laws and then they just, Suella Braverman, when she was Home Secretary for Liz Trust for five minutes, the the only thing she managed to do was be like, uh, the new public order bill, if you've ever supported a protest online, I can put a fucking tag on you and ban you from going protesting. And it's like, oh, okay, you've got that free, did you? I think it's, I think it's through, I can't remember if it's with the Lords, but that's the other thing as well. I feel like there's this big barrier to trying to talk about these things whereby you can be incorrect about certain details and therefore people then go, you're stupid. You got it wrong about the second or third reading. Yeah. And then you get scared off trying to talk about it. Yeah. I know. But it's scary, I would know, like, because then it just gives them a blanket thing to just, like, end MD who protests anything, and mm. then they could just, you know, put you in jail or whatever, like that. Like, and even like the, today on the news, they were saying about the, they did one their court case about doing that thing to send folk to Rwanda, mm. and so Ella Braverman had said about the. Like, oh, it's her dream, eh? you know, I see a plane take off. And you're like, well, I mean, dream. it's quite quite far <laughs> away from Christ. fucking Martin Luther King's dream. It's the <laughs> very exact fucking opposite of anything. And you're just like, what a fucking depressing state of affairs. Yeah. Yeah. But then the worst part is like, you see the whole kind of ecosystem bubbling up to legitimise it. Like I saw this article the other day by Matthew Paris, who like pictures himself as a very like left wing Tory. Mm -hmm. And he was like, even liberals like me need to agree that deporting people to Rwanda is actually the right thing. And I'm I'm like, Fuck no, sake. it's not a liberal position. It's no. a deeply yeah. reactionary position. But there's there's so many people like that in the Sorry. press, even on in the left wing things and all that, and it's like, oh well, like and they're really just kinda of more centrist or whatever, but they're like, Well, I'm left wing and this is as far left as you're allowed to go. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you know, so of course we all agree this and then you're like, No, there's a whole spectrum of yeah. opinion and, you know, things like that, but it's just not allowed within the confines then. Do you ever feel like that? Like if most people now in lots, not not every opinion, but in lots of opinions, are fuck are significantly to the left of what is being touted as mainstream. Yeah, and then you just look back and it's like, has that just always been the case that everyone was there the whole time being like, these fucking cunts don't represent me, and like everyone's just had to deal with it. And then you look yeah. back and people look back and think, God, all those people were so like I, this. Like I think uh, it's true, and I think that's why they never campaign really on policies. It's always a personality you know, and all these superficial things, and then. Yeah. The Tories of it's cowtowing a lot to people's fears and you know of the other and all these different things, but it's like yeah, like I remember watching the Noam Chomsky years ago and he said, look, public opinion is is largely to the left of both political parties because you know people like it's obviously in America, but it's like people want their public health care and all that, but that's just it's just not even on the table a lot mm -hmm. of the time. All these things that most people would want, um, you know, probably if you put like all the stuff for the strikers, not probably most people would be in favour of it in this mm -hmm. country, like giving them higher wages and all that, but you know just. It's, if it's not within the interests uh, you know the people with the power then it's not going to happen but I definitely think that that is true that most people are, are more to the left even yeah. if they don't realise that they don't even identify with it if you actually like, ask them their opinions and stuff yeah. they would be like they would want a fairer society yeah, yeah. well you look at like with, with Corbyn like they did manage to like definitely completely sour public opinion against Aye. him but if you look at the policies people are like 75% support 78% support I can't say yeah, support. Even <laughs> the point now where they're bringing in some of the stuff though, like cause the four day working week and all the, and the, mm. the broadband and all that. I remember I was in London just after Corbyn got, became the Labour leader, right? And I was in, this sounds like a pure excuse for reading The Sun, right? But I was in a roll shop <laughs> and they had a copy of The Sun. I just, I was curious. You just wanted to join in with English culture. Yes, I was trying to embrace, you know, <laughs> I was like, stuff. right, pay for a ticket before I got on the train, read The Sun, all that sort of stuff. But I remember reading through it and I was like, oh, see if you just didn't really know that much about stuff, you would think that Labour had just appointed fucking Osama Bin Laden as a leader because the way they Which were they should have done. <laughs> <laughs> he got shit done. The you know both of them fans. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's the sad part is like what they said about Jeremy Corbyn was like he's a Stalinist and he's purging all the right wingers he's doing he didn't do any of that and he no. fucking should because what they've done now is like purged every left winger from the party like made it impossible for left wingers to like hold positions of power but I did promise myself a couple of years ago that I would never waste a breath 
talking or thinking about the Labour Party ever again in my life. But unfortunately, it's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, in Scotland, the Kena is. So. <laughs> but I know some people in the Labour Party in Scotland who are super sound as well. Yeah. And it's like, oh, this is, why does this have to be so complicated? Well, a lot of the people who are in SNP you know, basically are from like Labour families and stuff, and it just sort yeah. of, they yeah. can't, you know, they just moved over to a place where, you know, the, maybe like, their views are more welcome, I suppose. But like, um, it's a depressing thought. And to, what can you say? The world is a depressing place. Mm. Yeah, the world's but, a fucked up place. He's, the the world is a Stevie fucked says. up place. That's, <laughs> I, thought, I did not want to bring this vibe to the show. No, no, no. no, 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 no. So, guys, so I've got a yo yo. <laughs> I fucking love it. I wanted to talk a wee bit more about you doing stand up as when you're 14. Like, yeah. how do you go about writing jokes when you're that age? Because you're talking about like expressing yourself and stuff as well. Yeah. I don't think I had anything to express when I was 14. What? I'm like, not sure I did. I think it was pure love of performance right. that got me in there and but did you also, love stand up before yeah. doing it yeah I loved watching stand up yeah. I loved watching comedy I was obsessed with it I feel like every comedian starts out as like a super comedy fan as yeah. a kid yeah um, and then I loved it got really into it um, and it was actually my mum like there was a workshop at an art centre near me which closed down obviously <laughs> and um, uh, it was like grown ups and me and they like took me under their wing and were very sweet and like basically used to like book me little gigs. And to be honest, I wasn't writing that much. There was a guy who ran the workshops and he would be very much like, you've got to just focus on developing your own voice yeah, and focus on mining what you think's funny and developing that. So that was a really good standpoint. That's good advi- advice for yeah, a young he, person. Yeah. yeah, he was never like, Okay, so you need an opener about where you're from. <laughs> <laughs> and you need a good joke about that tells everyone how you look. You know, like shit like that. It, it was much less formulaic and much more like yeah. kind of atmospheric. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I did stop writing. I didn't write that much. I only really, the first couple of years that I did it, probably wrote about 20 minutes in total. And I loved it. I loved doing it. And it was exciting to be at that time the only person really I remember there was one girl who'd won a teenage comedy competition and I remember seeing a picture of her in the newspaper and being like my nemesis <laughs> <laughs> but I never found her again I don't think she does it anymore uh, because she used to write the jokes with her dad uh, yeah. and I was like she had a Are you a com- yeah she fucking she wasn't even a comedian she was basically <laughs> she just, had a ghostwriter yeah Come on. she was a presenter really <laughs> I don't know what happened to her but I remember that it was really exciting and, and it was exciting for me because like I lived in the southeast London suburbs, like quite far out. I would say like as far out as Clyde Bank is to the centre in, in proportionally. So like right. I said, I want to go into town, but it was always like a big deal yeah. as a kid. And then to suddenly be like going up to London, being on a bill in a gig and like showing up and doing it. And I think a lot of the goodwill was probably people being like, why is there a child on stage? <laughs> yeah, you know, Cockney but, chimney sweep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I definitely had that vibe of like, yeah. oh, I come down these. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, it was great. It was nice. So what what age were you when you done like your first proper comedy club? Uh, was that 14 or? No, I did a couple of gigs when I was 14. Then I had to do my GCSEs. And then <laughs> I did a couple when I was 15. Then it was like 16 to 17. But also for me at that time, I had no clue about gigs. So I'd do like a gig in a basement to four people. Or I'd do a gig to 600 people and I'd be like, a gig's a gig. <laughs> I didn't sort of think There's like, no that gig's not important, that gig yeah. is, you know, like this gig is run by like a real chancer. This gig is like an industry gig. Yeah. I'd just be showing up like, right, I've got my bit about oranges. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then when I was like 21, I, I or, when I was at uni, I ran lots of gigs that were really anarchic and really fun. And then when I was 21, it was like, right, we're going to do this. this. Yeah. I did about three years of like temping and gigging every single night and, did you have like a, a break going to between at any point or did you always do it? Yeah, I sort of always did it, but I didn't do real. When I was at uni, I didn't do many actual gigs. I just did uni gigs. And it right. was because I had an agent at the time who just was not the slightest bit interested in booking me gigs. Like basically right. took me on because the person who'd originally taken me on left, mm. but was not interested in having me as a client. And so I'd ring up and be like, um, I was wondering if you could book me some gigs. And he'd be like, well, you died on your ass in October, 1999. So, <laughs> <laughs> so no one will book you. Can't and I'd be it. like, um, this doesn't feel right. <laughs> I was, I've done that. Yeah, it was a funny time. It was weird. But, but now you see like, there's loads of comedians now that you look around and they started when they were kind of like, 14, 15, 16. Yeah. Um, and I like it. It's like a sweet little club of people who made a bad decision. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, like May Martin talks about starting really young as well and like being in that environment at such a young age and it can be quite 
you know yeah quite like odd. seeing people doing cocaine and stuff like that backstage and yeah there was a lot of stuff like that although i think i was largely quite lucky insofar as i didn't have like traumatic experiences i yeah. had like largely quite positive positive stuff. experiences yeah. which is like a and also to be fair like at the time i was at school and it was so it was like a very hot housey school it's like a grammar school so you had to like take a test to get in and they were like we've got to have our results and that was yeah. like an intense <laughs> fucking environment and then like my home life was not good so i felt like this spy who had this like secret good life <laughs> where i'd like go on my own on the train like come home yeah and i suppose i think i was very lucky like i'll be on the train home at like 1 a.m and like chatting with strangers and then walking home on my own it was just like just in this bubble of like, I'm fine. Yeah. Yeah. It was so you went to gigs yourself? That yeah, you on my own. Yeah. Up you? to London. Yeah. Like Matilda or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that was funny too, because like, I think I had an unusual experience as a teenager because I used to like go to nightclubs on my own when I was like 13, 14. Oh. <laughs> and at the time we were like, they let us in because we look so mature. And now I'm like, no, that's not what they let us in. The bouncer's been reading Lolita as well. <laughs> Listen, uh, thanks so much for joining us. It's oh been God. a lot of fun. It's really Thank nice you. to talk to you guys. And I'm so sorry to like have a bit where we're all like the state of the world. No, it's fucked up place. But I don't think, like, I feel more hopeful now. Like after 2019, I was so devastated and I was mm. like, I can't cope with it. And now I think partly because I live where I love and I've got my family and I feel so lucky. I feel in a position now to be like, no, it's not. <laughs> I'm fucking, I haven't roll got sleeves, sleeves. So I'm like trying to roll up. <laughs> but I feel like much more in a position. And like, that's literally what the show I just wrote is about. It's about like being like, right. Uh, there's a, a quote which is like after defeat re-enchantment is necessary and you have to like fall back in love with the world and f and be ready to like re re magicify the world yeah well, that's a good i think that's a necessary sort of message of hope to end on <laughs> yeah because yeah, yeah, yeah. so we I, usually end on like a philosophical question but i don't sometimes. know if we got any i think that's is, i think we're not going to get more profound than that <laughs> yeah, exactly. so thank you i'm oh just God, worried about what's going to happen to the world the next time you decide to make a film <laughs> Yeah. It's fucked, isn't it? Yeah. And also, then it was so like, right? Like, on one hand, it feels like it's tapped into something, and on the other hand, we didn't want to tap into something. Yeah, we just wanted to make a fun. Well, yeah, I could. I love to talk. <laughs> no, and I could talk for half hour. So I no, I don't. that's great because that's, that's what we need. Yeah, we like to not talk. Right. No, no, <laughs> please, please go on, Joseph. Yeah. Is there anyone who does a podcast where like someone really fucking won't talk? Like, as in someone who's like a regular host. And they're like, what did you do? And the guy's like, no. no. That's good. Yeah. 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 I can help it. Like, so guys, I'm, I've been researching. Yeah. Research. Yeah. I half watched the film. <laughs> Hang on, what is it? Right, this is what I want to ask you. What age were all of you when you started doing stand-up then? Uh, 21. Okay. I think I was 22. 22. I'd done two gigs when I was 20. And then I didn't do it for like a year. And then I think I started properly again when I was just coming up for 22. Wow. And did you guys want to do it when you were teenagers, but you just didn't feel like you could? I wanted to be an actor. And my dad told me that the only way to do that is become a stand-up comedian. <laughs> the only way to do that? The only way to be a single person in Hollywood. Used yeah. to who is he based on? Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think who's done that. Did he give you an example? Was there like an example? Yeah, uh, oh, but no, basically I loved Home Alone and I was like, I want to do that. <laughs> And I was like, well, you know, some of them are comedians, probably. And I was like, are they? What, that wee boy, Kevin? <laughs> Remember you since just... you're watching, like, Jingle all the way, and you're like, oh, that guy Sinbad, he's a comedian. <laughs> this I'm... is it. When you've got no family in the industry whatsoever, so, like, none of my family had ever done anything like that. We didn't know anyone who'd ever had a career like that. Yeah. And so, like, the advice you get is, fucking terrible when yeah my mum insane. was like focus on a plan b yeah I'm like why that would be plan a <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah because oh, so i was because like, it would be like maybe like robin williams films or like jim yeah. carrey and he'd be like oh they were comedians yeah. so to do that you need to be a comedian and i think that's what he genuinely believed that right. he was just what, selling fucking right? mantelpieces or whatever so i don't know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how he had this. i love it if he didn't even want to sell mantelpieces he wanted to sell like lampshades it's like you can't go in on the mantelpiece <laughs> sell the mantelpiece build up to the lampshade <laughs> this time next year i'll be selling fake football tops across the hill. <laughs> that's what i want to be done and do you still want to act as well uh yeah i, I, I like doing sketches and stuff so yeah. i'd like to do both but I, st I started watching comedy because I, s I thought I need to watch that to become a comedian and then I started loving stand-up yeah, yeah. you know that's like watching stand-up and Aye. stuff so that was my my way in my best friend initially wanted to be an actor and then when she found stand-up was like ah oh, oh, right okay this, this is, is better 
yeah. absolutely. In ways. For me, I just kind of like, I, I never really wanted to do it growing up, but I always just liked having a laugh and I, I loved all like, co- even just like sitcoms and things like yeah. that. And then I think just at a certain point, to be honest, being for Clyde Bank, like when Bridges made it big, kind of, and I always was like, I'm never going to be as funny as him. Oh. But like, because I just, he was just a different type. He was just a, one of these sort of like, yeah, it's naturally funny guy. And I was like, I never thought I'd be like that, but I thought, well, I can write and I've got a sense of humour. And the real thing for me was when it was like, I realised like, really most things are like, are like takes, you're kind of rubbish when you start out. And if you work really hard, I think you can get better. And I was like, well, if that's the case for almost anyone, I'd love to do it. I'd love to do comedy. That's yeah. so good. So I just tried also, it. Also, that's such a good attitude to be like, look, if I do this, I'll get better. Yeah. That was yeah. it, kind of. So I was, I was lucky in that regard. But I never, I was never, I was never like, oh, I'm so funny. And, you know, everyone should listen to me. It was like, well, it seems like a fun thing to do. And if you work at it, you can get better. So yeah. I think when, that. when I was about 21, I was like, this is all I've ever wanted to do. Even though, especially there was a period when I was in 20s in clubs. And I don't really do clubs because it just doesn't vibe with me. I'm too, whatever I am, I don't work that well. <laughs> and I remember just dying on my hole for like a fucking year and just having to say to myself, well, there's nothing else I want to do. I just have to do this the rest of my life or I just die on my ass. <laughs> <laughs> this will be my life. <laughs> and then thank God that did stop. Um, yeah. What about you? When did you do it? Yeah, I was about no, 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 21, 22, I think. I was like, yeah, I was absolutely obsessed with comedy when I was little, you know, sitcoms and stand-up and everything. But I would mm-hmm. never have had the confidence as a teenager. But I just got to the point where I'd kind of thought about it too much to not do it, I think. And like you, like I'd read and listened to so many interviews with comedians where I kind of knew that you just had to suck for fucking ages. So I was yeah, like, yeah. oh, I can do that, you know. Aye. Did it to once. Be fair, right. If the contract was like, would you like to be shit at this thing? Everyone would be like, sure, I'll be <laughs> shit at that thing for a bit. Yeah. And then actually then you're not and then it's all right. I yeah. remember that feeling of being like 22 and being really jealous of like people that were my age but they started when they were like 17 I'm like oh, oh this prick's got five years on me <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> I'm gonna be that shit in, in five years yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and especially sometimes when you'd show up and do stuff and people would really underestimate you and you'd be like I actually do know how to hold the microphone <laughs> <laughs> I actually do know that you can't put it too low <laughs> <laughs> then... move the mic stand out the way and all <laughs> yeah. that that's... get it out the way so you can move yeah <laughs> one, one thing I think about sometimes is though I'm always like sometimes when I'm writing this stuff and all but I, I'm always kind of almost trying to think back to write what was I like before I'd done this and what was what was oh, my, yeah. you know trying to think like as a non-comedian in a weird way like but like you're so young and you start like and you like and you, when you've been doing it that long like do you still feel like the person you were when you started in some ways or like no I've never not had it in my life I think um, I've always I think really identified with it and it's always been a part of how I interpret the world and and also like now I know I have ADHD like every other comedian but like <laughs> at the time it was the only place where I didn't feel uncomfortable a lot of the time like not all the time but like on stage I felt comfortable yeah. and I felt able to make the best of myself I don't yeah. know so like yeah for me there's no way that I can go okay if I wasn't a comedian well I mean you do think no. you know you do sort of try to have a lot of empathy and understanding and try not to be like, isn't it funny when you're all comedians out there or whatever, but at the same Mm. time, like I just have to accept that it is what I've always done. And like, there's been times when I've rebelled against it and tried to stop for a bit or been like, you know, for better or worse gone. Okay. I didn't even try anything else, but like in other ways, like I'm lucky because I love it. And it's my little thing that I've had forever. And I can, you know, you can do it when you're, 90 years old uh, yeah it's amazing and we'll have to because we won't have pensions so yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to be out there there will be a time won't there when there's like 75 year old comedians like having to trot out having to do like... it. yeah unless you've got like a you've well sold a book or something like that and you're just living off that i think that's the pension plan for most comedians, isn't it? I'm looking forward to this podcast being like a real life version of Still Game. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, it'll be so cute! But You're running out of tea cakes, Stephen. <laughs> Sign up to the Patreon. <laughs> I saw a tweet the other day that said soon old people will be playing computer games and it's very beautiful but yeah, there'll be people yeah. who've been playing computer games their whole lives who are 70 yeah mm-hmm. you're saying earlier on everybody's grandparents been alcoholic it's like I lost my, my granddad to Call of Duty that <laughs> 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 so, was, was his war that he was in <laughs> oh, the thing that kills me is like uh, before the pandemic I was really good at never being on my phone in front of my daughter when the pandemic hit it was so stressful and also unmedicated ADHD in both parents we were like on our phones more and yeah. now 
she just is really aware that I have my phone. I try not to have it on with her, but like sometimes you just end up yeah. doing it and it's so depressing. And that is the thing that I think like, fuck me, like in 10, 15 years, yeah. that's going to be a big thing generationally where lots of kids, their parents are on their phone too much because they couldn't help it. Kids yeah. are yeah. going to be visiting grandparents and it's going to be the grandparents that are on their phone. <laughs> the time. That's yeah. what it's like. Yeah. Actually, I don't, that may actually <laughs> explain why they want to be YouTubers and TikTokers because they just want their parents to see them. <laughs> 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 no, but no, my parents, it would be them leaving nasty comments. On <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. Well, listen, I think that, that bit covers it for uh, for this week's episode. Uh, Josie, thanks so much for joining us. Um, Thank you, you go, for having me. Thank um, you. You've got, you've, you're on tour in the new year. You're doing uh, the stand in Glasgow in January. I, I am, but do you know what? It's actually sold out. Sold out. Oh, nice. But I'm doing um, the Giffnook Eastwood Park bit. But Oh, nice. there we go. That's Brilliant. great. Yeah. Well, so if, that uh, and there's tickets left <laughs> or no? Yeah, so that weirdly, like my my audience in Giffnick isn't as large as my audience in the city <laughs> centre. So I would like to especially extend a hand to the people who run the gluten free bakery in Giffnick to please come to my gig. Yeah, <laughs> sure, hundred percent. And uh, is there anything else you want to plug in? You mentioned the podcast earlier on. Anything else? Um, in June, on June the first, I got my book coming out, and it's short stories. There we go. And I'm so proud of it, and I love it. But you can pre-order it now, and pre-order. it's this thing where, like, if everyone pre-orders it instead of buying it, then the first week it looks like it's sold a fuck, a fuck yeah. ton of copies <laughs> yes. and makes it seem really good, and then it's really good for it. And but um, yeah, listen, really Josie, we'd love to get back on it, and by then I'll read the book, and Steve will read half of it, and we'll <laughs> 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 finish the first half of every short story. <laughs> yeah, that's what I would love if you like. So the, all these stories seem really happy. <laughs> Oh, don't read the end. Don't read the fucking twist. <laughs> Little pop quiz for Mark at the end. <laughs> that is cruel that your professor did that to you. I know. I know. Ma- fucking you. Matthew yeah. Creasy. I think he's still there. But, there you go. Anyway, sure. but listen, uh, thanks again, Josie. Thank you so Josie. much. Before, before we go, uh, just please remember and give us a like, like and subscribe on YouTube. Uh, give us a five star review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And you can follow us at Some Laugh Pod on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. And you can also send us an email at sumoffpod at gmail.com. But until next time, guys, we'll speak to you soon. Thank you. Cheers. That was very slick. That was good. I've done it so many times. One of your better ones, though.